Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. All of your meetings today are focused on the future, on marketing plans, quotas, what needs to be done in the coming year. And that's as it should be. In a dynamic company like ours, none of us can afford to spend very much time looking backwards. But the decade we leave has been a very unusual one for IBM. And I simply couldn't let this day go by without a brief look at where we were as the 60s began. It tells us something, I think, about where we're headed. The story is told, really, in this annual report for the year 1959. Two out of three of you watching me weren't even with the IBM company in those days. So most of you have probably never seen the machines featured in this document. The 705. The 650. The Ramac 305. They're historic landmarks now. In fact, the first 702 computer is in the Smithsonian Institution today. The concept of the 360 didn't even exist at that time. No one had ever even heard of SLT technology. Our typewriter division was not yet marketing dictation equipment, nor had the Selectric typewriter been announced. We were just introducing the 1401 and we had no idea what its reception would be. There were other uncertainties as well. The consent decree was only three years old, and we still weren't sure what its full impact on the company would be. Until 1956, IBM had been run pretty much as a monolith. Given the size we were then, running the company that way had worked extremely well. But as we look forward to 1957 and beyond, it became apparent that a new concept for operating needed to be developed if we were to manage the growth possibilities ahead of us. And so we went to Williamsburg, Virginia, and set in place divisionalization, line staff relationships, and the overall concept of decentralization. As we moved into the 60s, however, we were still unsure whether this new organization, then only three years old, would stand the test of time. Competition looked particularly formidable that year because a number of America's biggest companies had recently entered our field. A few announced that they intended to cut our share of market dramatically. We were running scared, and we still are, and I hope we always will. It's healthy. The facts, the numbers, all illustrate what's happened since. We've come a long, long way in a remarkably short span of years. I venture to say that no company in history has come as far, as fast, drawn such attention, and made such an impact on so many segments of society all around the world. And most of those impacts have been good. I'm particularly aware of this sweep of events, these achievements this morning. It's been an exciting decade for me and I hope for all of you who have been a part of it. I come out of it with an immense sense of gratitude to every IBM man and woman who helped make it happen. As we move out of one decade and into another, I want very much to convey to all of you my most profound thanks and the thanks of all of my associates in Armonk for your commitment and your effort. It's been a great many individual IBM people who collectively make up this company and its management team and make us look good. I never have and never will forget the source of this company's strength and success. The world has changed dramatically since 1960. We see these changes all around us, in national and international affairs, on the campuses, in the style of our lives, and in our children. These changes have not always been easy to accept. They've not always been changes for the better. They've demanded from each of us adjustments, new efforts to understand, new determination to make the long-term future the kind of future we want for ourselves and for our children. In business, too, over the past decade, things have changed. Here, too, adjustments have not been easy. 
But IBM and its people certainly have responded to the changed environment superbly in the 60s. And I'm confident we'll do so again in the 70s. We have, in fact, already begun. In data processing, for example, IBM's new way of doing business is clearly a response to a changing world. It's never been easy to enter a new business, and we've entered several of them all at once as we begin to sell some of our services for the first time. All of you who have done a remarkable job during our transition period. I know that what lies ahead will be tough and demanding, but that's the way our business has always been. Long range, I'm confident that the results of our new policies will benefit not only the industry, but the company and everyone in it. There will be other changes in IBM as we move through the decade. I'm sure most of you came to the company because it was a dynamic company of change. And it will be no less so in the 70s. We'll be changing our organization, our products, our marketing strategies. We'll change whatever is necessary to keep this company moving ahead. One thing we've tried not to change in the past decade, one thing we are unwilling to change is our concern for and our feeling about IBM people. We've worked very hard to bring into this company the kind of individuals who want to make it more successful than when they came aboard. And we've worked just as hard trying to provide the kind of environment that they need to grow personally and professionally. Our need for that kind of man and woman and for that kind of environment will never change. We're looking for men and women with an insatiable desire to make things better, a healthy dissatisfaction with the present, and an abundant hope for the future, plus the willingness to work hard to forge that future into the form that they hope for. I've been saying for a year or two now that $10 billion in revenue was in sight for our company. Looking ahead, that figure looms vastly conservative. There are many indicators of things to come. DP's record-breaking 3,500 new accounts last year. In field engineering, the improved performance of our engineers and our products. World Trade's DP sales record, more than 50% better than the year before. The continued strength of System 360. OP's growing product line and its new marketing strategy. But in a way, the Systems 3 story alone tells all there is to know about what IBM people in any part of the company can do. From ground zero, with a completely new machine, you and the data processing division did such a remarkable job in just a few months that despite what appeared to be an optimistic forecast, we now have a delivery problem. You can be sure that will be whittled down. A lot of people are working on it. But what you've already done makes it clear that IBM will occupy a strong position in this low end of the commercial market. These are only a few of my reasons for my confidence in the future. In my estimation, there's nothing to hold us back. Not the legal suits, we'll come out of those all right, nor the competition, even though it will certainly get stronger. Nothing can hold us back if the people in the IBM company will perform with the same skill and dedication as you have in the 60s. If we believe in each other and in our goals, in our relevance and in our ability to improve our society, then I know this company will move as excitingly in the years ahead as it did in the 60s. We are, I believe, only at the beginning. Good luck to each one of you.